so that your, your presence and, and your grace, Lord, just, uh, that you just fill the space, Lord. And, and I ask that the message tonight, Lord, uh, that it penetrates our hearts, Lord. I ask that you give us specific uh, takeaway items, Lord, that you could be with us, Lord, because we know that everything that you do, Lord, is for a purpose, the good times, the bad times, Lord. And I know it's the bad times, Lord, that we work through and that you show up. So I ask, Lord, that uh, even in those things, Lord, that you just meet us there. I ask that you, that you give me the gift of prophecy, that I may deliver your word to your people, Lord. I ask that you rest with hearts today, Lord, and that ultimately that you will be glorified. I ask that of all your saints from our chairs, here as we pray in one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom, 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 thy kingdom. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> okay. All right. So I'll give everybody a couple minutes just to kind of get their coffees all right. And I can finish the rest of my Urban. So. Um, actually, I might say, I might say some water for that. So does anyone remember what series we're in right now? Miracles. Miracles. All right. Does anyone remember what miracle we covered last week? Water to wine, right? Why did we cover that one? It was his first public miracle. Yeah, very, very nice. Um, so I'm going to do the same thing that I did last week, too. And to, the, to as many as we can, can we move towards the front? Just because it's weird for me to have like, you know, six people here and like 10 people back there. So. Oh, the coffee? You're waiting for the coffee? Okay, we'll wait for the coffee. I'll tell you what, man. Go ahead and prepare your brother's coffee. The older should serve the younger. And then um, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so today, does anybody... Actually, I'm not going to have you guys guess. There's way too many of them. But um, today we're going to be covering a different miracle. It's the second miracle in the book of John. So can anyone guess what it is? I'll even drop the chapter on it. It's John 4. You know, ironically, it's not considered one of the miracles, right? Because I kind of thought it would be the Samaritan woman too, because although like that interaction was very miraculous, that was more of like a prophet type thing than like a miracle type of thing, because there wasn't anything like supernatural that kind of happened. So... I was doing a little research on that, too, because I was flipping through John, and I was surprised that they didn't count that one as a miracle either. So, later in that same chapter, open book test, guys. If anybody wants to pull out, you know, John 4, it's open book. You guys can go ahead and look into it and see exactly what goes on in that chapter. Thank you for joining us, Christina. Tom just brought that up, and uh, <laughs> we just said that it was not considered one of his miracles. <laughs> Hold on. He heals the official, uh, official son. Yes, the nobleman's son's healed. So we're going to read through it real quick, just so we have proper context, uh, context of the story. I'm going to drink a sip of water. Thank you, Rudy. So we're going to, uh, to read from 46 to 54. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and to heal his son. And um, for he was at the point of death. And Jesus said to him, unless the people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, go your way, your son lives. So the son believed, at, um, believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. And as he was um, now going down, his servant met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour of which they got better. And he said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left, left him. And the father knew it was at the same hour in which Jesus uh, said to him, Your son lives. 
and, the son, um, and he himself believed and his whole household. This again is a second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. So I will tell you, um, let's set the scene here a little bit. So if we remember, and we kind of already said, where were we last week, right? When we were in this, we were at Cana of Galilee, right? We were at the wedding of, um, and, and this one, when I was kind of doing my, my research, it says that this was his second public miracle that's documented. Like, I don't know if other stuff happened, but this is clearly one that was documented. Um, and personal confession was when I was, like, we've all heard this story before, right? Like, we, we've all heard it. And at this point, I, I always had previously thought that this miracle happened at, like, the height of his popularity, right? Um, and, and I'll kind of share with you why, but not at all, right? Like, we're talking, like, this is John 2, right? And, and, and we see exactly what happens, right? So we know that before he turned the water into wine, that was in John 2. In John 3, he met with Nicodemus, which was in Jerusalem, would not, not in the same area, right? Um, then also in that chapter, St. John the Baptist exalts him. They said that that happened in Judea. In chapter 4, he converts the Samaritan woman. Where did that happen? Samaria. Samaria. That should be an easy one, guys. Come on, stay with me, okay? Um, but here we go, right? So in, in, in John 2, you know, at that time, most of his teaching has been prophetic, right? He's been talking about things that happen. If you go even with Nicodemus, Nicodemus realizes that, you know, this guy, he, he, he's a prophet, right? He's definitely a teacher, could be a prophet, right? Um, and, and I'm sure that there's other stuff that happened in there that's probably not recorded, but there's something here that just kind of caught my attention, right? Because when you read this, it basically says that this man was from where? He wasn't from Judea. Yeah, Capernaum, right? And Christ at this point was in Galilee, which means that this man traveled 20 to 30 miles to go see Christ. And the first thing that kind of takes, like, you know, makes me really kind of think about this, right, is what would make somebody who has a child on their deathbed travel 20 to 30 miles, right? And, you know, I know 20 to 30 miles to us doesn't seem like a big idea because we just jump into our car and we drive there and that's probably like a 20 to 30 minute drive, right? But imagine how hard it is, right? How hard it would be to leave your child in that state for that amount of time, right? Like, how would you do that when your son is at a point of death? And he did that hoping that he would track down Christ. Like, even that idea in itself kind of blows my mind because you don't even know exactly where he is. Because even when you heard where he was, by the time you get there, he could be somewhere completely different. Right? Like, you don't have Find My Friends, you know, there's no app that tracks him. It's literally just like, you know, you're literally just trying to find him. And the first thing that hit me was when we do hard things in pursuit of Christ, right? Like, he left on a 20 to 30 mile journey to go find Christ when he had a kid dying at home. And when you do hard things to go look for Christ, God never disappoints. He never disappoints, right? And there's a part of me where I always kind of like, you know, think about things like this where I said like, I wonder if it was like him finding Christ or Christ being in the right position so that he can find Christ. Like he knew where this man was headed, right? And maybe he situated himself so that he can meet this man, right? And, but my question is, is like, Why? Like, why did he go after him? At this point, right, it's not like he had been healing the multitudes. It's not like at this point all of these crazy miracles have been going on, right? At this point, Christ was mainly known as a teacher or a prophet. And, and we see that, like, throughout the Gospels. But I will tell you that I believe that word got out, right? It's not by, it's not by coincidence that he went back to Cana of Galilee, Someone had spilled the beans about what happened at that wedding. Like, we know that it was done, s like, super secretly, right? As a matter of fact, it even says that, you know, the, the bridegroom didn't know, the master of the banquet didn't know, any of that stuff. But if you remember, who did know? Who saw it? The servants, right? And I guarantee you, when the servants saw it, you know, they had to tell somebody. Because how do you see something like that and not share it, right? 
So at this point, this man, like this nobleman, knew that something was different, right? He knew that this man was different. This man had power. He had power to transform, to create. And I, I guarantee you, because he came up, what did he come up for, right? What's the first thing he tells Christ? Uh, I'm trying to find it again. Let's see here. Yeah, come down before me. So what, what's he showing up for? He's showing up for, for healing, right? That's unprecedented, right? Like no one, that hadn't happened yet, right? It, does, it doesn't make any sense. Like, okay, I got you. Like there was water and it turned into wine, but that's not what he's asking for here. He's coming for healing. And then when you think about who this man is, right? So the nobleman, right? It's, it's translated as like, this one was like, he was like a royal person. He was an important person right? Chances are that title was because he was even someone even that was close to Herod. So you can imagine how powerful, how important this person was. And then he basically, you know, goes and he implores him to come and to heal his son because it was at a point of death. And Christ, you know, honestly, kind of like sharply rebukes him, right? Um, so we know that, and it also, he rebukes him as a Jew. So you know that he's a Jew, Right? And there's this thing where, like, with Christ, the playing field's always level. Like, do you think that he impressed Christ the way that he showed up as a nobleman? Do you think that he impressed him with his relationships? Do you think he, he impressed him with how close he was to Herod? Like, no, not at all. Right? He didn't care about any of that stuff. And he basically rebuked him sharply. But I'm going to tell you there's something about this man that we can learn. Because when it comes to our kids, none of that stuff matters. Like this man, even when he came up, he didn't bring up the fact that he was a nobleman. He didn't bring up his position. He didn't bring up any of these things. He didn't bring up if he felt he was a good person. He didn't bring up if even he felt if he was like worthy of this healing, right? And I think when, when it comes to our kids, none of that matters. Because when it all comes down to it, what was he? He was a dad with a sick son, period, right? That's all that mattered and that's exactly how it came. And when we go through the Gospels, one of the things that you'll see over and over and over and over again is people bringing their kids to Christ. People whose kids are struggling with something, right? Whether they're sick, whether they died, whether they're demon-possessed, all of these things, the first thing their parent would do, they forget about everything else and they come and they bring their kids to Christ. And I will tell you, we need to do the same. Every single one of us needs to do the same right? Might not be sickness, you know, it could be temptation, it could be a, a stage of life that they're going through, it might be a sickness, it could be a bad attitude, it could be bad friends, it could be a stage of life that they're going through, but I am telling you, we need to mimic this man here and come, leave everything else at the door, right? Like, don't worry about who you are, what your position is, you know, what you do in the church and or any of that other stuff, or how much you feel that like, hey God, like, you know, look, look, look at what I have done, look who I am, right? But we just need to bring our children to just lay them in front of Christ, and just be like, God, I need you. Like, I need you. Like, my kid needs you. Right? He comes as a broken parent to Christ, and he asks for just for help. You know? And it's such a broken statement. He says, come, heal my, my son. He's at the point of death. Right? And that's where Christ, like, kind of, like, sharply rebukes him. Right? He says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. And that sounds harsh. Right? Like, it sounds harsh. But at the same time, it's 100% true, right? When we look through the Gospels, we see exactly what happens. And one of the things that I'll tell you is, and we talked about this before, is like when Christ performs a sign, does it burden him, right? Like I still remember like, you know, total sidetrack, but do you guys ever watch that, that, that show Stranger Things? Okay, and every single time like that girl like, you know, performed like a work or whatever, like it would drain her, right? And it's just like, like, that is not the situation with Christ. Christ could do this all day, right? It doesn't, it, it, he, un, untapped, right? Like limitless. He can do whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted, right? They cost him nothing. But do you know what does cost, cost him a lot? Like, do you know what does hurt him? When he performs these signs time and time again, right? And he sees the people loves the signs, but they don't love him right? They'll follow him for the signs, but they won't follow him. And I'll tell you, that's one thing you see throughout the Bible too, right? You see it with the feeding of the multitude. You know, you see it in all of these situations where Christ basically says that, yeah, you're following me, but you're following me because your stomachs are full, right? You're following me because you want something. But the second you get it, like you're gone, 
right? And I'll be honest with you, and I think that word is for every single one of us because I think that we're very, very quick, right? We love the miracles, right? We love to ask for the miracles. We love for the fruit of the miracles, right? But if you're honest with yourself, haven't we seen enough? Like, haven't we received enough? Like, will anyone say that, you know what, I'm still on the fence? Like, God hasn't shown up enough for me. So, you know, if it's just, if it's just this one more, then I'll believe, then I'll follow, then I'll offer. Because we've all seen enough. But the question is now, now that we've all seen enough, what do we respond? Like, what do we do with that? Right? Like, what's next? And there's something to think about, right? Because signs and wonders can lead to a personal belief in God, right? I think we can all agree with that. Like when you see something crazy and miraculous, by all means, right, it can, it can lead towards belief. It can validate a message, right? But at the same time, it can do absolutely nothing. And I think we've had those experiences too, right? Where God shows up, he does something, and we're like, wow, I can't believe that God really did that. But it doesn't change us at all. And we go right back to living the way that we were always living. And another thing, and I was thinking about this when I was preparing, because in our Thursday night um, men's group, we're covering uh, the 10 plagues, right? And I think in a society or in a culture where we are always chasing after the next sign, right, where we're always looking for a miracle, and we always say, God, you know, if this is it, then do this and do that and do all of this other stuff, right? We were, when we were talking about Moses, it was clear that Pharaoh had his magicians, and they were able to do signs as well. And I thought, how scary is that? Because a lot of the times we could be looking for the signs, but the signs might not be God who's giving them, right? Because they were able to mimic all the things, and they were able to do what looked exactly like what God was doing, right? And we can't depend on signs, because if that's all it is, then it's, that's very dangerous, right? We have to acknowledge that everybody has signs. The good has signs, the bad can do signs. What's the point? And we also, even if it is God's signs, because in, you know, in Egypt, how many plagues did he send? 10, right? In those 10 plagues, did, Bar did Pharaoh buy in at all? No, <laughs> right? Even the 10th one where he let him go, he still had buyer's remorse and wanted to go get him back, right? So, and there's a lot of these times where we say, man, all I need is a sign. Like if I just had this sign, if God showed up here the way I need him to show up here, right? Like it would completely transform my life. And I'm going to tell you, chances are, it's not true. It's not true. Could it be? Maybe. But it wasn't true for Pharaoh. Right? You look through the Gospels, it wasn't true for a bunch of other people. And a lot of the times we sit there and be like, well, I'm not Pharaoh. You know what I mean? Like Pharaoh was an evil guy, right? <laughs> like he, he thought he, he was God. So I'm not Pharaoh. If, if God gave me those signs, I would totally believe. But the question is, is like, is that really true? Because if you look at the nation of Israel, which were God's people, right? Not only did they see the signs, the signs were for their benefit, right? They watched the signs when they had these plagues come, these plagues hit the Egyptians. And when they were in the little town of Goshen, like they were untouched, right? So they saw the sign plus one, right? But what happens when they get out of Egypt, right? They get out of Egypt, they go into the wilderness. What do they start reminiscing about? Egypt, right? It was even worse than that, right? The Red Sea parts, they crossed through on dry land. You got a couple chapters later, what are they doing? They're worshiping a golden calf. And what did they accredit the golden calf to? They said, this is the golden calf that brought us out of Egypt. How? How? After everything that you just saw? After everything that you just experienced? Like now you're going to give the credit to the golden calf that you made with your own hands? How does that work? So I'm going to tell you guys, like, it can't, it can't be about the sign, right? It can't be about the sign. And the other thing to keep in mind, just like Tom said, right? So this is happening in John 4, right? His second miracle. Okay, what else happened in John, in John 4? Samaritan woman, right? Did she need a sign? She believed at his word. At his word, right? Are you feeling convicted yet? At his word. And I'm going to tell you, like, I think it's great because, like, you know, so he came, the, the nobleman came to uh, Christ and said, come heal my son, right? He's at the point of death, right? Christ 
answers back sharply, basically saying, all you guys that need signs, right? You guys won't believe unless there's a sign, right? And I'm going to tell you, this is the thing. It's everyone loves a good sermon, right? <laughs> so, so like this normal man was like, hey, like I understand, right? But he just reiterates the same thing to Christ. He said, sir, come down before my child's eyes. Like that's like, that's like, I know that you're talking about this stuff over here, right? And the fact that we shouldn't need signs and, and we shouldn't need all of that stuff and our belief shouldn't be dependent on these signs, but I have a sick son who's about to die and I really need you. Like in desperation, like I need you, right? And, and, and Christ rebuked a faith that needed a miracle to believe, but that's not what this man was looking for, right? That, that statement was for everybody else that was around, right? This man just had a desperate need. It wasn't about his belief. It was just about a desperate need. And then it's crazy, right? Because, you know, we see situations like this where someone will tell him, like, Christ, come, I have a sick son, right? And then he say, okay, like, I'm going to come. I will come perform the healing, right? Um, but in this case, he didn't, right? You know, it's crazy because and this man even, actually, I'll take a step back, like this man didn't come as a nobleman, right? He just came as a desperate man with a need. And you can imagine that was probably very out of character for this man. This man, when he showed up, he probably was used to being ushered to the front of something. He was probably in the, you know, his, his requests, like, you know, if he said that he needed something, he probably had a, a bunch of people who were trying to meet that need for him, right? But he knew that right now he was just a desperate man, right? And showing his status of throwing his weight around, he knew that it would get him nowhere with Christ at all. It would do nothing for him, right? And I'm going to tell you, when we come to Christ, we need to come in that same attitude, right? And, and, and I will tell you, the reason why we can't glow about how worthy we think that we are is because when you are in the presence of so much, someone so much bigger, how could you have pride? If you're standing in front of Christ and you're telling him, well, Christ, this is, this is what I need from you. And, you know, I go to church every Sunday and I'm faithful with my tithe. And, you know, I, I pray and I, I do this and I do that and I do this and all that. And I'm going to tell you, if you even attempt to do that in the presence of God, you don't see God correctly. Simple as that. You will, if, if you could utter those words, then you're not seeing God correctly. Because we will never have a level of stature, status, or performance to ever earn anything when you see God correctly. Instead, this man went to Christ and he just pleaded his need. He pleaded his son's need, the misery of the situation, and the fact that his son was at a point of death. Like it was dire. And Christ basically responds back to him. He says, okay, well, do you really have faith? Like that's, that's almost like the paraphrase, right? He says, do you really have faith? Go your way. Your son lives. That's a rough response. Like, I'm going to tell you, is it a blessing? <laughs> yeah, without a doubt, right? But that's a tough way to deal with that nobleman, right? And remember last week, we talked about the fact that, like, you know, when you get into these, these miracles, there's layers to them, right? Like, we look at this miracle, and what do we see? We see a man whose son's dying, who needs, you know, he needs his son to be healed. But I'm going to tell you what Christ did here. He takes that need, he meets it, but he goes further, because Christ's point of a miracle was never just to do the miracle, right? So here, you know, I'll tell you, I think that that's rough because for this man to hear like, okay, cool, your son lives, like he's like, all right, I'm 20 to 30 miles away. Like my, my kid could very much be dead by the time I get there. Like how, how much peace is that going to give me, right? But Christ put him in a position where he was forced to believe, Right? There was no outward demonstration of the miracle. There was nothing that, that really, other than the words, there was nothing that necessarily gave him a peace of mind. But I'll tell you that this man had faith. This nobleman had more faith than I would be able to have. He had an extreme faith, right? Because the next words in that verse, it says, so the man believed at the word that Jesus had spoken to him and went his way. Like, imagine that right? Imagine that, that just out of the words that Christ spoke, it totally gave this man peace and he was able to walk away. If that was me, and I question it, if that was you, would that have been enough for you? It's almost like dismissive to me the way you just said the rest, like go your way, like go, 
yeah, let go, he's fine. You know what I mean? Like I probably, I would have grabbed him by the hand and then like say, we're going, right? Like we're going, like you and I, we're going together. Like I want to see this kind of take place, right? Yeah, let's jump on the camel and we're, we're heading out. Um, but it's crazy, right? How do you go from, I'm completely desperate to like, all right, cool, I'm good. I'm going to go walk home now. Like something, something happened there. Like what kind of faith was that? And honestly, the only answer I can come up with is it's, it's the type of faith that we all need. Like, that's the best way I can describe it. Like, I don't really know. And I, was, I remember I was listening to a sermon one time, and, uh, and they were making this point. And, and it says, basically, like, if you're at work, right, and, like, we all work with people. And we know people who are, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Dependable, right? And we know people that were undependable, right? Like, I have... Uh, one associate that, that works with me and every single time, like, you know, if I need to have something like faxed or scanned or something like that, I just give it to her and I say, hey, can you go take care of this, right? And, and then I never have to follow up, right? Like, I know at, <laughs> at my word, right? Like, if I say, hey, can you go do this? She does it, right? On the other side, I have this other employee where I say, hey, can you, can you take this and, and, and fax or, or scan this? And half an hour later, I'm like, you know, sending her an email. Hey, did you do, you know, oh, yeah, you're going to get to it? Okay, cool. 15 minutes later, hey, is it sent? Like, can I, <laughs> you know? And because we know that we have some that are dependable and some that are a little bit more free spirits, okay? And they need to be corralled a little bit more, right? But the question is, is which way do we treat God? Right? Like, we see that we pray about things, right? We pray hard about things, right? And my, my fear is that we treat God like the undependable employee, right? And I, it's a bad word to even use employee, but like undependable, where we, we pray it and then we, we keep following up and say, hey, did you do this yet? 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 Right? Where we, what we really need to do is we need to pray and we need to hand it over and we know that it's taken care of, right? Now, I'll tell you the hard part is because we talked about like last week with St. Mary, what does St. Mary do? St. Mary didn't say, hey, they're out of wine. Can you make some more wine? Right? She just pointed out the problem and said, hey, they're out of wine. Right? And I think that that's, you know, that's kind of what we need to be a little bit more like. Right? Like we let the supplication be known to God and let God work it out and trust that he is. Um, so this man, the nobleman, he starts heading home. Right? Which, again, blows my mind, should blow your mind. Right? And while he's on his way, his servant comes out and he tells him, your son lives. And I love the, the nobleman because his response is like, yeah, I know. Right? Like, yeah, what time did it happen? Right? And it says the seventh hour. Right? Yesterday at the seventh hour. Okay? So does anyone know what time the seventh hour translates into? One. One. One p.m. Okay? Which means that this guy was not rushing to get home. Wrap your mind around that. He was not rushing to get home. Like, this guy was probably going home on a e like, leisurely stroll. Right? Probably stopped the night before, grabbed some dinner checked himself into an inn, you know, spent the night and was just like strolling home like the next day, right? And that's another sign that this man had amazing faith, right? Just at the word he was able to believe. And this is the part where I say that this is where we go down a level, right? So we, we initially think that this man is a man who needed his son healed, right? That was the purpose of the miracle, the healing of the son, Right? But then it says that he believed in his whole household. See, he believed. Didn't also say that he believed at the spoken word? Right? So I'm going to tell you, um, did he believe again? A thousand percent. A thousand percent. And I'm going to tell you that we can believe, and then we can also have a deeper belief. Okay? There's like levels to our belief. Okay? And that's what happened, because when he heard it the second time, that belief was reaffirmed, and it was deepened. And not only him, but his entire household. Don't you think that was the point of the miracle? It wasn't just about giving this kid life. It was about that whole, entire, that whole household that needed to believe. Right? And I'm going to tell you, when you take a step back and you say, okay, you know, that's a hard trial, what they had to go through. Right? You can imagine your son, your daughter, your child. You, know, you can imagine them getting sick. Right? And then you can imagine and be hopeful that they're going to get better. Maybe it's a cold, maybe it's a flu, maybe it's a whatever. And you're watching this deterioration. Have you ever felt more helpless as a parent? 
right? And it's getting worse and it's getting worse, it's getting worse, it's getting worse. And it's getting so bad, it's to the point where like, I'm going to leave my child that might not even be alive when I get back. Because I'm gonna go on this 20 to 30 mile journey in hopes that I find the healer. And imagine the state of that parent, imagine the state of that household. And I just want you guys to think about the fact that it is the deepest and darkest moments of our life. Like this was probably the darkest moment that this, that this nobleman had ever experienced can be what saves us. Not only what saves us, but saves the entire household, right? Because without that deep and dark moment, there, ne there never would have been glory on the other side of it. There, they never would have seen the light of Christ without that deep and dark moment, right? And I think that's applicable to many of us, right? Because a lot of the times we, we want a deeper faith right? We want to see glory, right? We want to trust more. We want to be like, you know, we want our faith to be strengthened. But at the same time, we're like, God, I want all of those things, but without hardship, without darkness, without tribulation, without any of that stuff. And then unfortunately, that's exactly where God does those things. So when you look at this, why did God allow this little kid to get sick, right? Because he knew it was benefit, not only for the kid. Did that kid have a testimony? That kid had a testimony, right? Did that nobleman have a testimony? That nobleman had a testimony. Did that whole entire household have a testimony? That whole entire household had a testimony. And I guarantee you that household looked a thousand percent different moving forward. And if you went back to that household and you said, was it worth it? Was the hardship worth it? What do you think they would have said? A thousand percent. A thousand percent. That's the purpose of Christ's miracle. Believe and deeper belief. You know, last week it said after the miracle, it said the disciples believed and the water turned into wine, uh, when the water turned into wine, right? This week, after the miracle, the entire household believed of this little child, right? And in 54, it says, again, this is the second sign that Jesus did when he came out of Judea into Galilee. The first sign was to persuade his disciples. The second sign was to persuade a nobleman and his entire household. You know, the funny thing going back, the Samaritans, they all believed without a sign. They believed at his word. So something I want us all to think about, okay? The first miracle was at a wedding. The second miracle was at a tragic event. And Jesus was just as real in both. He was just as ev uh, evident. But both of these miracles were born out of a bad situation the running out of wine, the, 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 the illness of the child. But Christ's goal was not just to heal the situation. It was not just to make the pain go away. It was not just to solve the problem, right? The big picture is darkness can always be exactly where Christ meets us. You know, one of the favorite quotes I ever heard was, the darker the room, the brighter the light. And I feel like a lot of the times in our life, we go through some dark stuff and the dark chapters and things where we just wonder like, dude, what is going on? Right? And I'm going to tell you, it is the darkest of moments that can catapult you straight into the light. So the goal is that we have to look for Christ in these situations, in every situation. We have to look for Christ in this situation. We bring our need to God. We walk in faith, right? And we believe that as crazy as it is, and if we're coming to God and we say, hey, God, I have this problem that I need you to fix, expect God to do more. Because in this situation, in the last situation, he always did more. They brought a need, but he met it so much more. But they just had to persevere through it. Amen? All right, let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of all God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word today, Lord. We thank you for all the examples that you left us with, Lord, about how you take these situations, you allow them to happen, Lord. But it's in the darkness, it's in the hard times, Lord. It's in the times where we are just so outside of ourselves and we come to you just as desperate that you love to shine your light. Not only to, to shine our light for our benefit, but from the benefit of all of those around us, Lord. At the wedding, everyone benefited from the wine. From today, Lord, it was everyone in the household benefited from your love. So Lord, I ask that you instill inside of us Lord, that, that faith to follow you, to come to you, to bring all of our problems before you, Lord, the same way that this nobleman did, Lord. And we ask that you show up in the same exact way that you did, where it was real and with healing, Lord, that with, with your light, 
that you can be glorified, Lord. I ask that you be with this group here, Lord. I ask that you just work in us, not only today, Lord, not only in the last half an hour, Lord, but up until we meet again here next week. Lord, that you are a big God, Lord, and that we get to see that with our spiritual eyes. So, Lord, I, I, I ask that you encourage us to spend time with you daily, Lord, to read your words daily, to grow daily, and that ultimately, Lord, that our lives are pleasing to you. I ask that you have mercy on us, Lord, that you bless us as fast, Lord. To hear these prayers, lift in the session of all your saints and our we pray thankfully, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, who has the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.